if you can stay objective throughout that, if you can detach yourself temperamentally from the crowd, you get very rich. And you won't have to be, be very bright. I mean, it, uh, I'm sure you are, but, but uh, <laughs> you want, you know, it, just, it doesn't take brains. It takes temperament. Investors behave in very human ways, which is they get very excited during bull markets, and they look in the rearview mirror, and they say, I made money last year. I'm going to make more money this year, so this time I'll borrow. You know, or, or the neighbor says, you know, I wasn't in last year when that neighbor was dumber than I. I made a lot of money, so I'm going to go in this year. So they're always looking in the rearview mirror. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see a lot of money having been made in the last few years, they plow in and they just push and push and push on prices. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see no money having been made, they just say, this is a lousy place to be. So they don't care what's going on in the underlying business. And it's, it's astounding, but that's, that makes for huge opportunity, just huge opportunity. I mean, I've lived through roughly half, in an investing sense, about half that period. And I've had that long period of stagnation from 48, uh, I mean, from 65 uh, to 82, 17 years. I wrote an article for Forbes in 1979. I just said, how can this be? Pension funds in the in 1970, put 100 and some percent of their new money in stock because they were wild about stocks. Then they got a lot cheaper, and they put a record low in, 9% of their net new money in in 1978 when stocks were way cheaper. People behave very peculiarly in, in, in terms of their reactions because they, they're human beings, and they, they get excited when others get excited. They get greedy when others get greedy. They get fearful when others get fearful, and they'll continue to do so. And you will, you know, you will see things you won't believe in your lifetime in securities markets. And, the country will do very well over time, but you will see these huge waves. And, and, and uh, if you can stay objective throughout that, if you can detach yourself temperamentally from the crowd, you get very rich. And you won't have to be, be very bright. I mean, it, uh, I'm sure you are, but, but uh, <laughs> you want, you know, it, just, it doesn't take brains. It takes temperament. It takes the ability to sit there and look at something. When I started out in 1950, I would go through and find things at two times earnings. And they were perfectly decent businesses. And people wanted jobs at those companies. And everybody knew they were going to be around. And they wouldn't buy them at two times earnings. And that's when interest rates were 2.5%. You know, I went to the, I started selling securities when I was 21. And a Kansas City Life Insurance Company happened to be a fairly prominent company in Omaha. And the policies they sold you, if you were buying life insurance from them, had a built-in assumption of 2% interest. The stock of Kansas City Life was selling at less than three times earnings. You were getting 35% if you bought the stock. No question about the soundness of the company. I went to the local agent. I thought, I figured, hell, I ought to be able to sell him a few shares of stock. I mean, the guy ought to understand it. He's got his whole life invested in this company. I went to the local agent who had been with him for 20 years. And his name was Moose. I said, Mr. Moose, I said, you know, you're selling these policies with 2%. You may even have a few members of your own family, and you can buy into this company whose paycheck you depend on every month and, you, and whose future you, your, your beneficiaries of these life policies depend on and who you're selling them, you know, a 2% investment on, and you can get 35% on your money. And he said, you know, stocks aren't any good. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't sell you, you know, I'm a lousy salesman. I mean, well, you have to start with that. But, but uh, it, it just blew me away. It blew me away. I thought, sometimes I used to wonder if I was nuts, you know. And, and, but those things, the same thing happened. I mean, in 1964, the Dow closed at 864. At the end of 1981, 17 years later, it closed at 865. It moved one point in 17 years. Now, that's not a big move. And that, you, you can't believe the, how, how discouraged people were by that, by, during that period. But, you know, people were living better. But, uh, so things can go on a long time that don't make sense. And, but they do come to an end. I mean, the internet thing. I mean, you had these companies selling for many billions of dollars that, had no, really practically no prospects of making any money. That, that's, a, that's a bubble. But Herb Stein one time said, anything that can't go on forever will end. <laughs> now, that's a pretty, uh, but think about that. And uh, particularly think about it next time you're trying to do something just because the stock's gone up a whole lot, you know, and your neighbors make money or something. It, uh, you've got to be, you just have to sit and think objectively and think about, would I buy this whole business? If it's an internet company, has got 100 million shares out and selling at 100, that's $10 billion. Is it worth $10 billion? If it's worth $10 billion, it's got to be able to give you, you know, seven or eight hundred million next year. And if it doesn't give you seven or eight hundred million next year, <clears throat> it has to give you maybe 10% more than that the year after and continue to. There aren't a lot of businesses that can do that. And people just go crazy.